Creating an environment that is both believable and seamless requires a lot of imagination, a lot of money, and in this case, a lot of big pieces of styrofoam. The styrofoam was no problem. To save money, they went and filmed the movie in Mexico. And as for imagination, well, take a look at this. This is a typical backyard. But imagine being a quarter inch tall. Imagine blades of grass as high as California redwoods. Mud puddles as deep as rivers. Now, imagine being a first-time director like Joe Johnston, who has to create this world for the big screen in Walt Disney Pictures' Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I picked all the difficult things to do in the first movie. I had kids, I had animals, I had special effects. Johnston also had the support of a highly skilled team of visual effects experts, including production designer Greg Fonseca, mechanical effects coordinator Peter Chesney, creatures and miniatures supervisor David Sosala, and executive producer and former general manager of Industrial Light and Magic, Tom Smith. We're probably gonna use every special effect technique that I've ever encountered before. A lot of the effect will be achieved with the fantastic sets that Greg Von Seca has built. Uh, giant blades of grass, giant floor, giant everything. Everything, including the world's largest oatmeal cookie. A dream to any kid, a challenge to any prop department. The whole thing wasn't a big edible cookie, but a lot of it was. Watch 25 feet of polyurethane foam and real cream filling without 16,000 gallons of artificial milk, courtesy of a combination of chlorinated water, pigment, and food product thickener. It was slimy. <laughs> I mean, they, they couldn't use, like, real milk or, like, water, food coloring or anything like that because uh, at that size, we wouldn't make that big a splash. So it was like pretty disgusting, like swimming around in it, but it was kind of fun. We had a lot of scenes that were that were fun to do. Um, I get to fly in the movie. You know, how often do you get to do stuff like this? <laughs> Excuse me, but I have to go fly around the backyard today. Actors weren't the only ones flying around the backyard. A few crew members got into the act too. Well, the B for me was a guy by the name of Rick Victor who carried a, a handheld camera. And he was the point of view of the bee, and I had to simulate, sw I had to swat him without breaking his $180,000 camera, uh, take after take. To create the bee sequence, the blue screen technique was extensively used. It's a procedure that permits two separately photographed scenes to be combined, such as Rick Moranis swatting at the bee as his children ride on its back. Another technique called stop motion is used in the ant sequence. It's a process where an object is moved and photographed a frame at a time. The ant was definitely the most difficult, just because of the complexity required, and for all the different ants, there were there was there was an ant head that that we just used for close-ups. There was a, the the uh, full-scale ant with nine to twelve operators working it with radio control and cables and and wires and things, and then there was a stop-motion ant. No matter what technique is used, the goal is to make the unbelievable believable. In a comic book, the universe has to be believable and logical. The real world doesn't have to be at all, and it isn't. I locked into the signals being sent back from the Voyager spacecraft of Neptune. I've been watching since Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter. Voyager cost Americans 20 cents each a year, and man, did they get their money's worth. Talk about strange new worlds and civilizations. Now, some environments don't exist anywhere. They're just computer drawings. They're just signals in a wire, strings of electrons, phosphor dots all over a screen.
Creating alien environments is what comic books do best. After all, if you gotta fill a page, Superman's Fortress of Solitude doesn't take any longer to draw than a gas station. Although it does take a lot more imagination. In the 1960s, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee created the Marvel Universe. There are now 40 stories a month chronicling the adventures of the X-Men, the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, and all the other characters who inhabit that universe. If you're looking for a comic book with a fully realized and very well thought out alien environment, I can do no better than to put you on to Incal. Incal took eight years to make. It was written by Alexandro Jodorowsky. The artwork is by Jean Giraud Mobius. It's available in the original French or in English from Epic Comics. It starts with a small discovery and it ends with an apocalypse, but it's a happy apocalypse. It's a very imaginative, but very believable universe. This is a great comic. Woo. All the uh, stuff, this was a lot of new stuff at the time, and the special effects, and Eddie Keyes, who was one of the key people in the, in the special effects department, was responsible for this work, and they geared themselves according to what, the, what Raymond had uh, drawn in his comic strip. Uh, the mock-up of the uh, spacecraft, you know, the, was uh, taken almost verbatim out of, out of the script, lifted out of the, the costumes yeah. and everything. Um, it was a uh, hit, hit-and-miss type of thing. Uh, of course, they'd done the foggy thing, the dry ice, you know, they because the they'd done a lot of the haunted house things out there yeah. at Universal and stuff like that. Uh, one of the things that impressed me... Uh, I went home one night, and this is one of the nights that I got home a little earlier than usual, maybe at 9.30 instead of 10.30, <laughs> and happened to pick up uh, and look through the following day's work, which was uh, a couple of weeks after we'd been into the thing. And they had a scene where, uh, once again, I'm captured by Ming's guards, and they bring me into this uh, electric chair room, and they strap me to the electric chair, and conveniently there's an idol on a table right alongside of the electric chair. Ming comes in through the thing, through the door with the ray gun and he says aha flash again i have you in my power and now i'm going to show you the power of this ray gun and he turns the ray gun onto the and the statu statue melts before what? your very eyes how did they do it so did that's they... what i thought yeah how did they do it oh, so beautiful. i rushed to got before seven i went over to special effects to key's office i said eddie how are you going to do this shot today he said very simply i'll show you he had made a cast and he put in a steel dust in this cast. Steel dust, yeah. Magnetized it. Yes. Took the thing away, painted the idol any way that he wanted to paint it. Which and is once magnetized. he broke the contact, it just melted before your oh eyes. Oh, my gosh. The light bridge was a thing, you know. Get, Ming would get up on one the top of one palace of his to go to another part of the uh, his throne room or the, another part of the castle. The light bridge, he'd press a thing, ding, hit the other side. He and his retinue would go across. He'd reach around, turn it off, no light bridge. How'd they do that? Yeah. They shot it against the back, backdrop. And they took individual frames and scratched off the emulsion, little by little, a little bit oh. more in the next one, a little bit more in the next one. Again, there's a parallel because in, in, uh, uh, in Nogan's Run, the elimination process was done by carousel. And he, the time travel in Millennium was done with a thing called the gate. You, you traveled through the gate to the past or into the future. And so there are parallels, although the story is, of course, totally different. And uh, I think oh, one of the appeals to me of Millennium was the fact that here was, a, here was a chance to do something totally different based on a theme that I've always uh, been attracted to and, and, and loved. Do you see that? Do you see the red blob on the timeline? That is 1989. That's where you just went. And there's the mess you left behind you. It's a paradox, Louise. It's a potential paradox. You sent me back to get the stunner we lost. Well, here it is. What you didn't mention was that Smith was there. He'd already found it and stunned himself. And I don't think he was out when we found him. I think he saw us. Sir, I have a time quake approaching. Paradox. Time quake approaching. Four, three. A paradox, Louise. 
You've changed the past. I know damn well we can't change the past. It catches up with us. We change.